So we go straight to into the welcome remarks. Now welcome the British Deputy High Commissioner, Ben. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, just about. Yeah, good afternoon. Wonderful to have you here. I'm Ben. I'm the British Deputy High Commissioner based here in Lagos. And I always say to people, welcome or welcome back. And so many of you are friends and colleagues and we see each other in different places, not least here. So it's just really good to have you uh, with us and with us again. Uh, particularly delighted to uh, to invite and, and welcome our friends from Sterling. Always good to have you here, and uh, we we appreciate your commitment to the cause, and we join hands as we take on the challenge of climate change. So to be together with with colleagues from Sterling, but also um, our friends from the media in particular, uh, to discuss some of these challenges and the important role of the media, to be honest, in setting out how these challenges affect us. Temperatures are rising, storms are raging, crops failing across the world. We've seen in Nigeria, not least over the last months, actually, not weeks, uh, the floods that have devastated large parts of uh, the crop. And indeed, uh, we're seeing effects now. But of course, to be honest, the challenge will be in the next few months when we don't see the crop yields that we thought to see. So uh, these issues are not potential issues. They're not issues that might affect us in the future. They're, they're happening now, and we need to recognize that. If we look at the impact of climate change, and of course, COVID-19 in the time that we've had, Building back a fairer, greener, and indeed more resilient economy uh, is not just a priority, it's a necessity now. And governments and indeed gatekeepers across the globe, including in the UK and Nigeria, need to take that responsibility seriously. And it's really, really important that we educate people and socialize these issues. I was a bit disturbed, to be honest, to see some of the coverage in Nigeria, and then it, it went away. And, and the floods didn't go. And the floods are still there, and they're there now. And I think it's really important that the news remains the news. Uh, and indeed, if there's flooding that's devastated the town of Lakoja, the city of Lakoja, and I've been there, that should be front page news every day. So I think it's really important that we socialize these issues, we take them seriously, and indeed the media have such an important role in making sure that remains the case. Nigeria contributes less than 1% or around 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but is among the top 10 of the world's most climate vulnerable countries. And what we've seen is that flooding isn't something that happens, not just, it doesn't, doesn't just happen regularly, it happens more and more often with more and more damages. And I think, you know, for us, that's a lived, a lived experience. And for coastal states facing extensive risks from storm surges, particularly those of us in, uh, in Lagos, but also in the Delta, with inland flooding and pollution prevalent there, we really do understand that these impacts are generational. The middle belt, though, is also at risk due to aridity, compounded by high tensions between farmers and pastoralists around land rights and water access. And we know that these issues, when they come together, form a, a difficult and toxic mix. 70% of Nigeria's population rely on climate-dependent resources, and about 55% of the something like 200 million people in Nigeria have access to electricity. And fuel wood and charcoal are some of the major sources of energy for the rural population. So it's no surprise that deforestation is, the rate, it is at the rate that it is. And from 2013 to 2020, 99% of tree cover loss in Nigeria occurred within that natural forest space. And I know others will speak more eloquently about the challenges around that, not least, I'm sure, Desmond. But, you know, we see that too. We live it. And it's really important not to, to lose sight of the challenge. And urbanization too. If we live in Lagos, we know how many people are joining this city looking for opportunity. We understand that. But it's, it's about 4.3% per annum, with over 52% of the population currently living in urban areas. And again, we know what kind of damage that can do to the environment, or at least the kind of risk that it poses. So with Nigeria's population set to double by 2015, with that action to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change, there will be increased pressure on natural resources, and indeed the emissions profile, as well as climate impacts such as flooding, and in 2022, we believe that's impacted 31 of Nigeria's 36 states in some respect, with currently over 1.4 million people dis uh, affected, something like 800,000 displaced and 300 dead. And we haven't even calculated yet the total damage in costs. But I believe in 2012, it was something like $17 billion. So let's be honest, it's probably worse. So when we tally up the bill, that's real money to real people. Very, very hard to build back from that, but we have to. So the impact of climate change without action could cost between 6% and 30% of Nigeria's GDP by 2050. That's terrifying. 
And COP26, which the UK, of course, hosted in Glasgow in November last year, concluded with 197 parties agreeing the Glasgow Climate Pact, reaching consensus, hard-fought consensus, on the need for climate action urgently. And the text of the pact saw parties address the issues important particularly to African countries, including strengthening international cooperation on adaptation and loss and damage, and urging developed countries to at least double adaptation finance by 2025. Now, the UK's COP presidency ends this November, and our objective in 2022 was to maintain that momentum that parties built at COP26 and use this to support success, not least in the 15th Conference of Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD, COP15, which will be held in December 22 in, in, in Canada. We've been working very, very closely with the incoming COP presidency, Egypt, to build a partnership that aligns priorities and plans, secures the legacy of the Glasgow Climate Pact, and delivers impact and progress on the Paris Agreement goals in Sharm El Sheikh in just a, Sharm El Sheikh, in just a few weeks now at COP27. The global context has changed, but the goals are ever more urgent. And Russia's invasion, illegal invasion of Ukraine, has thrown into stark relief the link between climate change, energy security, and the vulnerability caused by reliance on fossil fuels, and indeed volatile markets. So we must urgently work together to accelerate the shift to clean power generation, including increased solar wind deployment, which the UK has excellent expertise at, and greater energy efficiency, which are the most effective routes to climate and energy security, and indeed our long-term prosperity. So the media must take up its responsibility as gatekeepers and the fourth estate to do that. Report the news, and the news shows that climate change is happening now around us to real people. When it rains in Lagos, you feel it. When it rains in Lakoja, you see it. And when the crops don't grow, you feel that too. So report the news, show what's actually happening around climate change, and keep the pressure up, please. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ben. Um, I like the emphasis you actually put on the importance of the media actually beaming a searchlight on the things that actually happen, because um, climate change has, act has an advert effect on every one of us, just as Ben talked about the flooding, the crop and things like that. So it's quite important that we put a lot of emphasis and attention to it. Next, we'll be able to call on the CEO of Stanley One Foundation, Beju Ibikwe, to come and talk about um, why we're here. Beju. Thank you, Wali. Um, good afternoon, everyone. The British Deputy High Commissioner, Mr. Ben Llewellyn Jones, the Honorable Commissioner for the Environment Legal State, duly represented, uh, the members of the Fourth Estate of the Realm, our partners, ladies and gentlemen. As we are gathered here in this room today, thousands of people are displaced. They do not have roof, they do not have shelter, and they don't know when their next meal will come from. As we're gathered here today, we have people in Lokoja, Kugi State, unimaginably distressed. Businesses, homes, and their livelihoods have been lost. Exactly two weeks ago, communities in eight local government areas in Anambra State were completely submerged on the flood. It's almost unimaginable, but it's our reality. And you find that we are suffering huge economic loss and of course huge human loss also. Uh, we were made to understand that over 76 people died while trying to escape from this flood. And um, disastrous flood incidences have been recorded in Jigawa, Lagos, Delta, Binui, 
by Elsa State. This is our reality today. Deaths due to flooding issues in 2022 alone has been put at 500 people with 1,546 injuries according to the National Emergency Management Authority. As partners and stakeholders, how do we respond to the rising incidences of flooding, heat waves, shortage of water, deforestation, and other consequences of climate change? In summary, this is why we are here today. The International Day for Climate Action is a notable day globally for us to take stock, identify the progress achieved, and also appraise the rest of the journey with a view to defining the most effective next steps to achieve the global goal of cutting down these emissions, emissions and going green. It is my honor and privilege to share my thoughts with you on where we are and why we are holding this dialogue. Before I continue, I must say a big thank you to everyone here for taking time out of your busy schedules. Someone mentioned to me that it's um, almost a miracle for you to find a lot of people gathered here. In Lagos, after it has rained <laughs> early, so I want to say thank you so much. Can you please put your hands together for yourselves? I know it's been a sacrifice for everyone. So, as the world pursues a transformative recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, it appears we are living in a greater pandemic with multi-dimensional impact and life-changing implications. Climate change is just as much of a crisis any pandemic humanity could ever, ever face. From the dastardly hurricane in Florida to disastrous floods like Mr. Ben has mentioned, I've also mentioned Lagos, Kogi, Anambra, Jiganoa, Benue, and counting. Properties, investments, farmlands, homes, and the most priceless treasure, human lives, have been lost to the impact of climate change. The State of the Climate in Africa 2020 report warned of the continent's disproportionate vulnerability estimating that by 2030, up to 118 million extremely poor Africans will be exposed to drought, floods, the e and extreme heat. We're already experiencing that. That was as of 2020. This, in turn, will affect progress towards poverty alleviation and economic growth, leaving more people in entrenched and widespread poverty. We have a goal towards 2030. The report also estimates that the investment in climate adaptation for sub-Saharan Africa will cost between 30 to $50 billion each year over the next decade, or roughly 2 to 3% of GDP, enough to spark job opportunities and economic development while prioritizing a sustainable and green recovery. As stakeholders embark on this decade of action for the SDGs, to accelerate it, these issues seem to be slowing us down, seriously. But one thing is clear, people and organizations are an essential part of the intrinsic system to be transformed and hence are critical partners in the solution design and implementation. We can only succeed if everyone plays their part. There has never been a more urgent need to revive damaged ecosystems than now. And we need urgent action to address these pressing issues. We must shift from harming the planet to healing this planet. Unfortunately, in our country, Nigeria, we still experience widespread ignorance, apathy, carelessness, and the lack of sustained commitment when it comes to issues and conversations around climate action. We have the sports of energy, but for sustainability, 
we're now looking for those that committed. And at times it seems like we pay a lot of lip service, like some, somebody mentioned just before this meeting. Um, she mentioned that she's had a lot of conversations and there's been a lot of lip service over a decade. But sustained action is always missing. The role of the media in communicating this effectively, breaking down the implications to all levels of government and society, especially setting the agenda and driving much needed action across all realms in society is critical and invaluable. Time is running out and nature is in emergency mode. To keep global warming, warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade, this century we must halve annual greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Without action, exposure to air pollution beyond safe guidelines will increase by 50% within the decade and plastic waste flowing into aquatic ecosystems will nearly triple by 2040. Today, we deemed it fit to bring together various stakeholders in the ecosystem in partnership with the British Deputy High Commissioner, to whom we are most grateful, and especially the media to heighten these conversations, drive commitment, to take action, harness synergies, and lead social impact investors in building the needed coalition to accelerate these climate action solutions. At the Sterling One Foundation, where I am privileged to work, we have executed various initiatives to provide advocacy, reduce plastic pollution, support capacity building, promote partnerships and collaborations to ensure a safer environment for Nigerians. We have adopted four beaches by providing capacity building for the youth in these coastline communities, providing remuneration and equipment to ensure they clean their beaches at least thrice weekly while recycling the plastic. So we do not just go and do cleanups. We empower the local communities to continue the cleanup so after the cameras are gone and the video cameras are gone and the reporting in the media has ended, the cleaning continues. And that is the only way we think it can be sustainable and that is what we have done at Sterling One Foundation. This keeps plastic from entering the oceans and contaminating a major source of protein for humans. Fish, I love fish while increasing economic activity and job creation. We recently confirmed the adoption of a new beach, a Lashe beach, which will support evacuation of plastic waste from at least three different African countries that settle at this location. We expect to get at least five tons of plastic out of the oceans weekly from just this location. And we're doing this in partnership with Loma. Our partner institution, Sterling Bank, is also set to launch Africa's first fully solarized building owned by a financial institution <laughs> as part of its contribution to green energy. At the Sterling One Foundation, we have a vision to plant 200 million trees before 2030. with our partners <laughs> emphasis on with our partners i say that because you call such huge numbers and people are like uh, if i will use our local um our local language they will say Imu. <laughs> what that means is that you're basically just joking but there's nothing partnerships cannot achieve so we're doing this with partners and we'll be starting this year by planting 10,000 economic trees across the six geopolitical zones in partnership with the Unity Schools and Green Sahara Farms. We will establish tree planting clubs in partnership with the Schools Alumni Association and ensure that the students are vested in the process. We realize that 
the major issue with tree planting at times is the trees are planted, but tree planting is not just about planting it, they have to be groomed. So it's not just about planting trees. And putting it in that environment, educating the children, the children get the opportunity to learn as they groom these trees. And they're economic trees, so it will also be a source of nutrition once they start fruiting for the students. And it's across the country, across the six geopolitical zones, we're doing 24 schools. For advocacy, we have held the first edition of the annual Africa Social Impact Summit to promote partnerships and collaborations towards the SDGs while driving impact investment into scalable solutions. Interestingly, this event today is one of the outcomes of the summit. And the second edition will be in August 2023. I'm glad to say that from ACES, I have met different people that attended the event, and they're kicking off partnerships on their own without the Stelly One Foundation. But that is our joy, because the ACES plat is a platform to ensure that partnerships can birth towards the SDGs, because the agenda of going it alone is extinct. Also, in partnership with the Federal Ministry of Environment and other partners, we are set to launch the annual National Sustainability Week to further drive nationwide awareness in our schools and other parts of society on climate action. Of course, we're trusting the media to keep up the conversation even when the week ends. Our strategy at the foundation is partnerships. I sincerely appreciate all our partners. Um, I'll call the British Deputy High Commissioner again. Sterling Bank, Right Foods, First T&P, Boni Bio, ProShare, Ventures Africa, the United Nations Global Compact, Giving.ng, Coca-Cola, the NCIC. Um, I really appreciate partners a lot because it has to do with trust and confidence. Um, the African Cleanup Initiative, LOMA, and a host of others. We have a lot of partners. That's our strategy. Because we know that no one organization can address these issues alone. We need the long-term partnership of the media too. We are grateful for all the media organizations that have joined us on this dialogue this afternoon. We believe you are here because you believe in this cause. So please, let me thank you in advance for your long-term commitment because we are confident you will do all in your power to galvanize everyone to act appropriately as we fight hand in hand, indivisible, to avert the deadly impact of this climate pandemic. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for that, and um, thanks for your emphasis on giving real examples of how climate change affects the lives of people. I mean, just this morning I read in the papers that um, about 500 Nigerians have died, and about 90,000 homes have been destroyed or partially destroyed, and this is just on um, just the flood alone. So it's really a very, very serious and important issue that we need to um, look and focus on. Next, we'll have a short um, documentary on climate change and the beach. The problem of which as a is that the is there. It is out there, it is in water, it is on the sea bed, it is at beaches, it is in rivers, the moon is in our waters. You know that the whole out of water is in our residents in there. There are even 10,000 people on a daily basis. Of this 17% of those that uh, are recycled. The quantity of waste that is being generated worldwide is over 300 million tons. On a year, we need about 42 million tons of this annually. That's from 2015 data. Uh, I've seen um, in the presentation that some of our acts and actions are caught. Um, we see just the regularly on TV. And so, so we want to get the faces clear and to remove these things that cannot allow for a sustainable life for people is a very critical decision to make and it's a right.
And Father's Day, eighty percent of the grace that we have to water is coming from the land. So that's why they have to come, let them know, don't allow this grace to get into the land. But by year 2015 now, based on the extension, instead of it bringing out fish from the water, it brings with plastics. So that's why they are ready to start now. And this is the only planet we have. We don't have any other planet, and this is time for us to restore our ecosystem. We pay a lot of money, we don't have to pay for it, we don't pay for it. It's also that people request for everybody to have to take the fish play and take it at our own day. We don't have to buy the fish one day and we'll open the bed of our fish and we'll find natural plastic inside the bed of the fish. We don't have to go there to that point. And then the survey that came very soon, every 50 years of war from now, we'll find any of these small plastic in the proportion that fish is. I want to think of climate action um, I'm going to be freezing to climate opportunities because I think people need to see that it's not all about just giving. It's about turning it into opportunity for revenue creation, for wealth creation, opportunities for job creation, and opportunities to lift people out of poverty. So every time we talk about climate action, let's think about the part of it that means that they actually creating so many other problems beyond just the climate. The Disney Up Initiative was a first wave of the Giving of Energy platform, which is a crowdfunding platform for social impact initiatives. It is geared towards improving the quality of life for life above water and life below water. The reason for this initiative is two points really. One, to impact the environment. Two, to improve livelihood. Because the people that we we gather together and empower to clean the bank, they're paid. They're also taught how to make a living out of recycling materials. If nobody can do this alone, it's a big project. They have to work in partnership to save our other work. We are privileged to be part of this project and to have these partners and we're looking towards getting more partners to join us because the problem of the environment is the problem of everyone. The challenge of the environment is the challenge of everyone. All of us need to arise and take ownership and do our bit, either financially, either as volunteers, or either as public partners. Everybody's 
waste to blood so And we will have waste to wealth and waste to health. Okay. The next thing will now be uh, a panel session. You know, a bit about what we saw in the video, but um, where and the focus is going to be on the role of media in climate adaptation. I'm going to call on um, the product leader at Study One Foundation, Guthrie Oji, to take that forward. Guthrie. I will quickly just introduce. Um, our panelists 
and then we'll get right to it. So um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Ibrahim Odumobi. Um, he's the managing director of the Lagos Waste Management Authority. Before, his, before this appointment, he was the executive director for business development at LOMA with the mandate to ensure sustainability measures for all programs, transformation, and change management. Prior to joining LOMA, he provided financial and business consultant services to organizations, HNIs, and some African countries for good governance. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Next, I would like to welcome um, the CEO of the Step Foundation, Mr. Lapiji Bipi. <laughs> okay, and finally, our third panelist uh, is Mr. Desmond Majokudumi, who is a founder and chief gardener at Lufasi National Natural Park. He's a lover of nature and the environment and has been instrumental in working with the Nigerian Conservation Foundation for the inclusion of the subject of ecology into the curriculum and is a governing member of the NCF. He is a known environmental activist and has played a key role in advocating for clearing shipwrecks from the Lagos shoreline. Mr. Desmond is an author, script and songwriter, documentary filmmaker, multimedia engineer, a musician, and a farmer. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much to our panelists for joining us. So um, we'll quickly get into it and um, I would ask the, um, the few questions, we just have a few questions, so we also have for the media some time to um, ask their own questions. So um, very quickly, I, I think um, we'll just get to, because this is a media dialogue, and my very first question would be um, about the media, the role the media has to play in climate change awareness. So what would you say, um, Mr. Desmond first, what would you say is the role that the media has to play in climate change awareness creation and adaptation here in Nigeria? A very crucial role indeed, like the fourth realm I've always done <laughs> for you know, civilization to develop is because of the media, because of people going out and exposing the truth and ensuring that we know what's going on. So it's a, it's a very, very, very important role. But having said that, <sighs> The challenge is tremendous because it's not as if we haven't known about the problem. We've known about this problem. You know, we're talking about floods, floods all over the place, okay? Terrible floods all over the world. Forty years ago, scientists from the World Meteorological Organization, the International Panel for Climate Change, told us that this would happen in about 50 years. The only place that they got it wrong was they projected a bit too far. It happened 10 years earlier than they thought it would happen, okay? And that's why about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, they really started panicking, and that's why we had the COP uh, 20, 2015 in Paris and all that. And everybody said, okay, yeah, the, the media is really trying. No, the media is, you know, telling us all about what the scientists were saying. Oh, oh, we're going to cut down on the reduction. We're going to cut down on the poison because <laughs> the same scientists that got it wrong last time they weren't getting it wrong now. And they were telling us, we have a small time frame to sort this out. And the media tried. And everybody said, oh, carbon reduction. All the heads of states of, of the whole world were there. Oh, we got to stop the pollution. Ah, bah, 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 bah. Guess what? Last year, last year, the pollution was higher than it has ever been for millions of years, despite the promises. So, the media has a very, very important role to play. You've got to stand strong and firm because there are forces that are working against you. Because when we're talking of these kind of reductions and when we're talking about the things that are necessary to save the environment, oh, and by the way, we call it environment, but guess what? <laughs> it's our life support system. And when we're talking about immediate measures to save the environment, then, hey, you know, we might be affecting the, the profit margin. And we can't, you know, we can't let the profit margin go down, you know. But if you're going to put the profit ahead of the people and the planet, you can't use money 
on a dead planet. Anyway, God forbid that shall be our portion. The media have an extremely important role to play, and you're going to do it, aren't you? Um, thank you so much, Mr. Desmond. Uh, you were just spot on, uh, on time, four minutes. So, um, Edu, within, within just three minutes, can you just tell us what you think the role of the media, especially around climate adaptation? Okay, so I think right now the role of the media is resilience. Um, has the media communicated climate change issues? Yes. Are the issues still rampant? Yes. But they can't give up. So I think what they're supposed to do now is, as the Holy Book states, have it done all to stand. 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 Um, more than ever, we need the media now to stand. Insist, keep on setting that agenda. Uh, one other thing I think the media would really, really, should really, really help us with is breaking it down to the common man. Yes, because climate change is Latin for a lot of Nigerians, like what does it mean? And we will be surprised that a lot more Nigerians have no idea what climate change means. They just understand that there are floods, right? So the media will help with breaking it down so the everyday man will know how, what they can do in their own homes, in their own kitchens, even with their own children. And uh, I think that is what the media can also help with. But first and foremost is resilience. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Uh, for me, in terms of the role of media in climate change, we need to approach it the same way we've been approaching things like recycling and circular economy. So if you look at recycling three years ago, uh, September 5th, 2019, when the governor launched recycling, has only three companies, maybe like 25 people working in the sector. Now we have 12,500 plus working in the sector, over 170 registered companies. The annual turnover of recycling is about 18 billion a year now. So, and what did he do? Just fully simplify it, keep it very simple. So, for the media, you need to be more of a catalyst for the awareness around climate change. It's not the finger pointing or blame, blaming or writing an abstract story. It's about making it personal. I was speaking to someone there when we were doing the meeting, great, that I find it difficult to understand why we are not looking after the hair you are breathing in. It's the same thing as you don't care about the food you are taking, you're just swallowing everything that's given to you. Eventually, you're going to die untimely. So the same thing happens to climate change in general. So the way media is, um, reports it, they need to focus more on attitudinal change of people. Government is me and you. Just me and you. Forget about pointing, pointing. It's you. What have you done yourself? Climate, what have you done to ensure that you are going to live longer on this planet and your unborn child will see this earth as your parents have handed it over to you? So it's very, very important for us to focus on the attitudinal change and keep it simple. And it's as simple as you as a media person seeing a waste in the middle of a road or a huge market having a waste nuisance. The reporting could be, ah, they are not taking it. Why are they not taking it? No, it goes beyond that. The pollution it brings, who dropped it there? What made you drop it there? Is it the right behavior? And I want to also state that I'm not a fan of people saying, ah, there's no awareness. There is awareness. Once you turn 18, you're an adult. You know what is good? what is right. So you know what is right. You take a piece of sweet there and you're licking it. You will not put your wrap on the floor because you can see everywhere it's clean. You put it in your pocket. So why do you not go outside and dump it on the road and then go like that? So we need to be very mindful. For climate change, for those of us that are in the waste management sector, on the recycling sector, we know a lot. 25% of the fish we are consuming very soon would be full of plastic. Some people like fish. Because of that, I'm scared of even eating it. I just, I'm more carnivorous than that. Because then you look at it, because they are going to take all this plastic. The plantings are hiding inside those bottles. Those nylons that you take from ShopRite and Co, where you go and shop, they take 80 years to decay. A bottle, 
will take nothing less than 400 years to decay. And no matter how tight-fisted you are, you are going to use 176 bottles in one year. 20 million people, over 4 billion bottles every year. 25 years ago, they've been producing this bottle. Where are they? Traffic, they are crossing it. Flooding, they are crossing it. Do the right thing. Why do you go to the back of your house and put your waste in the canal? Knowing fully well that you own that property. And when water comes, water takes anything that stands in its way about yourself and think about the impact on everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ibrahim. Um, you know, whenever you listen to climate change statistics, it's always scary. And then when we start to break the numbers down, you said 176 plastic bottles every year. Okay. Even if you are tight-fisted. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. We've, we've seen some very positive signs in the last uh, five years. We really have. Especially, especially in Lagos. La Lagos is really, you know, leading the way. Hmm? City of excellence. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, the job is gargantuan. It is massive, the population of Lagos. But with Loma, you know, we've been aware of that. I mean, it was about, ooh, how long ago? It was about 15, 13 years ago where I made a documentary called uh, Global Warming, Nigeria Under Attack, um, sponsored by the Green Party of Germany or something like that. Anyway, it showed the worst case scenario. It showed Lagos underwater. <laughs> and the incumbent government at that time were very suspicious of me. They said, ah, this, this, this guy is trying to you know, mess up our economic plans. But they checked out the documentary and within no time, in fact, Governor Fashola told me later, after they had started this uh, climate change workshop that they do every year, he said that the, you know, the, gov the documentary did inspire them to do a little bit more. And so Lagos has been a little bit at the forefront, and some of the corporate entities in Nigeria have been trying. But... Um, you said effectively, I think that's, that's the word. Have they been effective enough? No! No! They have not been effective enough at all. At all. Look, the Secretary General of the UN, King Charles, Al Gore, they are all saying the same thing. That this is the biggest problem humanity has ever faced. That's the reality. That's what we're facing. And we're approaching a point where it becomes irreversible and catastrophic. That's how serious it is. So are we showing as if, you know, our house is on fire? You know, God forbid there's a fire upstairs. And we're having such a good time here because, you know, the, the wine in the British Deputy High Commission is very, very good wine. And the snacks are fantastic. And the music is good and groovy. There's a fire upstairs. And you don't want to put out the fire with whatever resources you have. <laughs> because the implication of not doing that is horrendous. And as we said, it's will ensure that we make whatever sacrifices are necessary to look after the children's future and to keep them happy in a world that will actually become a better place. So the silver lining is actually very, very bright on this terribly dark cloud. Thank you. Right, Biju. Yeah, uh, I think for me, uh Effectiveness, we'll get there. If, if I put it in perspective, say, like I said three years ago, a lot of people don't know about recycling. A lot of people don't know about circular economy. A lot of people don't know about climate change. This was a sector that was existing like not existing. So it's changed now. Um, I'll tell you that uh, with the partnership we have with Subeb and some of the private schools in Lagos, all the public primary schools and some of the private, all the public ones mandatorily now teaches waste management as a 30 minutes curriculum every week. 
So with the generation to come, I'm very confident of that. They know what is right. They will do what is right. They will definitely do that. So all the public primary schools in Lagos are definitely doing that. We're doing that in animation for them. We're taking them on excursions and co. And some of the public, uh, the private schools are coming to us and they are doing terms and excursions and so. And throughout the ASU strike, for example, we take about 25 students every month throughout the strike that will go through internship with us in Loma to understand. And the aim is for them to go back to school and start environment clubs and co. Fine, that's happening. Also, the media has helped a lot in growing this sector. One of the biggest thing in, in anything you're doing is there must be an economic uh, value for it. If there's no economic value for it, forget about sustainability. We are human. Some of these organizations or individuals amongst us only behave in, believe in profitability and value. And that's why we try to create value, even in recycling, even in climate change, in everything we're doing. So part of the value we have created in recycling starts from things like a kg of plastic three years ago was 15 naira. Now it's 170 naira. It's not because of inflation, it's because there's a value created. Every bottle you drink will travel from here to China or Europe and come back as a pellet to make another bottle. But now what have we done? We've plugged that in. The first company in West Africa to do bottle to bottle started last month in Lagos. And their job is to take, their target is to take 1.5 million bottles off the system every day, non-stop, 365 days, five years before the machine will run down. It must not stop, 1.5 million every day. And how did that come about? Because the media are reporting the success we are having on recycling. So indigenous people put their money together, spend over 20 billion to start this company on Lagos Ibadan Expressway. And now we are getting there. And I know that their second plant, which will come up in two years' time, will increase the capacity to six billion worth of plastic living every day. If that is happening, you will see this plastic garden. So what is the next thing? Attitude. Separation of our waste from source and co. We also talk about Fibra. You see what Stelling One is doing? They are, I'm part of uh, a team that went to Ibeche to go and look at Ibeche and Lache community where we have all those big, big houses and all those shanties as well. And then it's only about plastic coming from all the West African countries down that road on the ocean side, the Lagos one coming from the lagoon side, and they are surrounded by plastic, and all they know is plastic. Some of the kids they have not even seen fishes before. They've seen more plastic than anything. And we went there. We saw the, the damage that was there. We picked 75,000 bottles in one day in two hours. The next day, I went there again. This time around for jollification. And everything was back again. So that's when I felt that in plastic, is the ocean calling that brings them. So eventually, I had a discussion with uh, the MD of Sterling Bank and, and Kweju, and eventually, we can now arrest that situation. So it shows that a lot has been done and a lot can be done. But mainly, for media, I want to ask and I continue to ask. Organizations like FIBRA, they are there to start doing a lot of other initiatives to help recover some of these plastic pollutions that we have around. But it's as if they are begging polluters to join them. They are begging the manufacturers to join them. Majority of us here were alive when we were looking for ego on the bottle of a coca of a bottle that he wants to go and win money. Abby. There was no plastic pollution at that time. So they brought parties to us and now they are polluting. The polluter must pay. And the only way the polluter must pay, and even in England and in the Netherlands, they, they have an EPR system that is developed. And we want the media to help us champion that, keep them responsible, do name and shame, let them do something about this plastic. For every bottle you buy in the UK or anywhere, there's a percentage that goes through the cleanup of it. It took Loma and Lagos State Government, a, a Ministry of Environment, a long time to even get them to put a sticker of recycling on that bottle that you see. And part of the success that we see in Lagos now and in Nigeria, starting from Lagos, and I give that to NBC, when we said stop producing green bottle for Sprite because in other countries they don't do it. 
it was a bit tough okay let's try let's pilot it now you will not see any green spray but you why because we stood our ground from the ministry of environment from lagos state to loma down let's do the same thing to other plastic because some of these plastics they are producing you can't recycle them there's no value for them the silo phones for takeaway it might be very cheap to get but when you say that the video of Marco Koda, you are looking at there, there are the float tables there. So if you gather the float table and there's no money for it, they value for it, who will gather it? So now people are gathering plastic because there's value for plastic. Can is not a nuisance. Have you seen can be a nuisance anywhere? Because there's value for it. So we really need the help of the media. They're doing a very good job to get us to where we are now. But one thing I realize is you cannot operate waste management in isolation. Even if we do very well in Lagos, what about our neighboring states? 1,000 people come into Lagos every day. For every 20 million people that have orientated, another 1,000 is coming to pollute it. And then I'm back to square one again. So that's why we need to promote waste management, recycling all across Nigeria and not just focus on ourselves alone. Thank you. Just quickly before we move to the media. Okay, I actually, I think the panelists have done a fantastic job. For me, um, before we joined, before I joined the nonprofit sector, I used to be in the financial services sector. And I know that, at least I can speak for Sterling Bank. I know Sterling Bank started partnership with Loma since 2008. And then being a partner to a cleaning company was not very fashionable because it was association with dirt, although we all created dirt, but then. So I can say I know that Sterling Bank used to be one, like a loan ranger in those days. I, I actually still engaged the MD of Loma then recently, and he was still profusely thanking me. It wasn't me <laughs> to say that in those days, Sterling Bank was the only organization that invested millions to partner with a cleaning um, company, a waste management um, regulatory organization then. But today, there are cleanups every Saturday. It's either this organization or that organization. So in comparison to five years ago, there is huge progress. There is significant progress. It is not just one organization doing different groups are doing it. Different organizations, we've been even been at the foundation, different organizations, SMEs have called us, they want to do clean up. So there is significant progress. It's obvious that the media, they're doing a great job. Um, but there's so much more that needs to be done. For the sake of our time, I won't say more than that. Um, and I'm sure they've already gotten the challenge and are ready for it. Okay, um, thank you so much, Beju. Uh, I think the media has gotten a lot of accolades here, and, but there's still room for sensitization. And for maybe those of us that were not, or that didn't catch what the MD of Loma said, he said for each bottle, they will pay 100 and how much? For one kg. For one kg. Oh, okay. So please. Between 120 and 170, depending on the quality of the bottle. Okay. So there's a lot of value for it. Because normally, after you finish processing, it's actually worth about 800 now. But right. the process go from build one, to lose one, to clean one, to washed one. So it, it depends. There's a lot of uh, awareness that is needed. See, for example, you pick a bottle, you cut the label and put the label inside, you make that bottle valueless. A lot of people do that. You finish it and you put the gala wrapper inside the bottle. It sounds like fun, but it's not. It devalues the bottle. So, but let us first get rid of the bottle first before we go to the other side of it. But I think we're making a significant progress in there. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I hope that that's enough motivation for more people in the room to, to start recycling. So very quickly, this is a media dialogue, and very quickly we'll move to um, the members of the media that are here present, as well as um, people in the audience so that they can just, I think we can take about three questions. So let me first ask my, my question first. Okay, my name is Esther Mopariola. I work with TBC News. So um, my question will be directed to Mr. Ibrahim Odumboni. You mentioned, 
You mentioned that um, the Lagos Waste Management Authority has engaged in so many activities, particularly circular economy through recycling and all of that, which is a good initiative, I would say. But it is another thing to sustain this initiative. Now, why I say this is because you also made mention of the problem, which is the non-recyclable of plastic bottles, which we know to constitute an environmental nuisance. Now, what will be done to address this challenge, even if at all you're trying to promote uh, recycling, people get to recycle their plastics and make money out of it. What about the non-recyclable plastic bottles? The dark green, for instance, this amber color, the brown color, and all of that, which litters the environment. What is being done to take this out of our environmental space if we are to promote climate action? And as for the media, what we've been doing, well, yes, we've done a lot in our, in our space to in, um, inform the people, educate them, and make them understand the value or the role they need to play. But I still feel that... Um, the challenge here now is people don't really understand, like you rightly mentioned, people don't really understand the role that they need to play, which we are on our own part, we are contributing. But I, feel, I still feel the, the government needs to do much more in terms of letting people understand that um, it's not just, you know, um, being informed, but where do you channel these, um, these problems, these um, environmental plastics, plastic waste and all of that. Why I say this is because in my own area, I stay in Ikurudu, and we have a challenge with disposing plastic bottles. I have a big sack of plastic bottles to an extent I couldn't, you know, exchange it for cash. So I literally gave it to these um, truck pushers, not, not, not truck pushers, sorry, these people that carry waste, Loma. So I gave it to them, just take. I, I can't keep it anymore in my home. There's this Pakam app that usually works, but it's, it's only limited in some areas in Lagos. So you, it's, it's difficult for hard to reach areas. So people who know about this, I tell people in my own area, in my home, you can recycle your plastics, but when you don't have people that come and collect them, it's not encouraging. So if we're going to do something like this, I think we should, the government or those responsible should you know, reach out as much as they can even as we do our own part to sensitize and inform them, they can also assist us by doing the needful. Good afternoon. My name is um, Funke Adesoji. I report for Civil Bay Television. Okay, I have a um, question and also have a, a comment. Um, for Mr. Odumboni, the Loma MD, I stay at um, Alakbere, K2. And then I see the activities of cart pushers there. They're very rampant in that area. And in my house, it takes a lot of time before we get the lawman to come and pick our refuse. And it's uh, a huge challenge for us there. So um, I've been trying to, I've done some stories uh, around um, lawman turnaround time. And um, I try not to be too one sided about the story. But at the same time, I'm really not satisfied because I would have really loved to hit the loma, but I just like, you've tried in some ways. But now my question is that, uh, how long does it take for your turnaround time? And then, can we know the number of trucks you have within Lagos Metropolis? And at the same time, eh, is there no way you can incorporate these cart pushers into your activities, at least to save us the the problem of refuse dumped by the roadside. It is a very common eyesore around those areas, please. And then on the side of um, sensitization, uh, you said something about once you're 18 years old, you should know what to do. Fine, but you know, some people do not actually know what to do until they are told what to do. And then this brings me back to the grassroots. I think I've done some reports around the Okubaba around Makoko and Ijorabadia and uh, Orile, then I see the magnitude of waste, especially in the water bodies around that area. And I'm sure if we walk, if you're coming from third mainland, we see the activity, we see heaps. And if we were coming from Bariga, the water side, I love Lagos, that uh, ferry side. You see that one too, I've been there. I realized that I was told there that they actually have those dump sites so that they can begin to sink it into the water to make rooms for them to build houses. And I begin to wonder that if they continue in this trend, we will have no lagoon again in Lagos. So please, um, 
what would Loma do to ensure they go into these areas, at least, if it's for them to just move this debt and make these people know that? And I know with sensitization, fine, but if there's a way you can break it down, make them understand this thing is wrong. If you build on waters and all of that, you're creating more doom for yourself. And then on the part of um, media doing fine, we are trying, but you would aid us, you will still aid us to do more if um, the sensitization, there's a partnership when you're going for this, your rally, you're going for your advocacy, you can just take us along. You understand? So we we'll know exactly what you're doing firsthand, not just you know sitting in offices or sitting in round table discussing it. I, I am a practical person. I go out. I want to see this done. You understand? So when I'm reporting it, I see and I know I'm reporting from the angle of what I have seen. So I really love that. And for Sterling One, um, I've covered a lot of um, beach cleanup by Sterling um, One Foundation, and I would still love to see more uh, remote beaches uh, you know, being um, uh, taken care of. And the ones that have been done before, I would, not, I would still appreciate if they can go back, like the Okunafa. I've been there some, some time back, um, courtesy of uh, Mr. Majakodumi. And I see that um, in spite of the um, encroachment of the water, there is still dumps of um, refuse there. Please, I, 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 don't, I don't mind if you can still sustain the advocacy there and also carry the media along too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Though. I'm, I'm very used to losing the questions. It's okay. <laughs> As part of the waste management uh, side of it. So uh, in response to Esther's uh, question around some of these recycling, some of these uh, waste that are potential recyclables, but we don't have off takers for them. So what we're doing on our path through LOMA and Ministry of Environment is to engage proponents, just like we've done to bring in an end user for plastic into this sector, to plug in that value chain, is to look for I an mean, advanced stage for refuse derived fuel. Because some of these things like xylophones, like all these green plastic, people like Lafarge, Dangote cement and coal, they can use them in the burning of their funnels rather than using coal. So we are still at advanced stage with them to talk about that. And then they probably off take the tires as well. So that's well and truly on its way. And very soon we'll probably come up to that. And then we've seen another proponent that came from Germany that wants to use the the flutables, the xylophones, to make biofuel, diesel fuel. So they've done their pilot with WeCycler. They've taken about 500, they've done about 500 kg on a weekly basis. And they've taken it for tests. They'll come back and set up a factory somewhere in the Bejuleki. And then you start seeing people gathering all those fruit tables. So you need to create value. And automatically, people will start gathering them. So we are advanced stage with that. So that will, that will come pretty soon. On the question that you have around uh, uh, recyclers around Ikurudu, I think the other question the other lady asks answers the question. So in the, on the issue of cat pushers, cat pushers are outlawed in Lagos completely outlawed and we're giving them opportunity to exist in the waste management sector through joining the recycling scheme. It, it, we're just asking for them to be formalized. So say, for example, you talk about the Pakam app. We need people to go to those houses to go and pick them up, the recyclables up. We don't need people to go and pick general waste up and dump it 10 meters away from them. So we've opened an opportunity for them to say, come to us. We'll take your bio detail, we'll register, we'll train you, and then we'll send you back to the community you are used to, to go and collect recyclables, which are value, rather than moving waste from uh, house A to house Z and just dumping it on the road. There's no way Kabuja can go to the dump site. There's no way. There's no way. They can't travel by leg that long. All they have to do is they just look around, nobody's watching me, off they do it. The waste that you see on the middle of the road are not thrown there by people that are walking past. They are thrown there by cat pushers. They are thrown there by motorists that move their waste from wherever they are. Some people are walking in VI and they live in Ikurudu. They bring all their waste here and then they dump it on the road in VI because they know that somebody will clean it up. So it goes back to our attitudinal change, attitude change. And when we catch people and we prosecute them, 
a lot of people is publicized well the media appetite for publicizing people that are prosecuted is very low that needs to increase it's only when we see waste that is very high there is waste here but when i'm prosecuting somebody for for taking eight bags of his waste inside the drain when it's raining then nobody is willing to put down on their dailies you understand what i'm saying so it's very important that we change our attitude in that way so please uh, i think for us we are going to leave no one behind we are going to accommodate anybody the waste management sector is big enough to have everybody to coexist cat pushers or no cat pushers transform from cat pushers and become a legal recycler that's all we are saying to them on what was mentioned about how many trucks we have um pre-2019 the number of trucks in lagos was less than 600 between loma and psp we are in 2021 2022 now and we have about 1170 trucks amongst us despite the economy downtown despite covid that, that sector continues to grow but we need to understand that the population of lagos never stays the same it continues to grow and the demand grows as well operating costs for our people have gone up by times four diesel 200 now about 800 so in a situation whereby people are not willing to pay it affects them as a private business on their own and the governor's government continues to subsidize whatever is going on by over 300 percent but a percentage of it has to be bought has to be bought by the tenor beds as well so if you have an area where the turnaround uh, time what is the turnaround time? the minimum standard for all our psps is to come to you once at least once a week we monitor them on a weekly basis at least once a week they should come to you but in a situation whereby they come to a street and only three people out of the 20 houses they pays the question is they go to the tree and then go elsewhere and that's why we are monitoring that but now there's a regulation that says if you don't pay for your waste you could be prosecuted so they should we've asked them to continue to take it if you like don't pay they will take it but when you go to court you pay the legal fee and you pick all the court fees that are accredited to you so for us in a situation whereby they are not coming timely or they are not frequent that's why we set up a call center for you to call us on those calls and those free lines to let us know what is going on it's not possible for us to know what is going on lagos is big it's massive so we need to exactly know what is going on if you are not being serviced why are you not being serviced a lot of people will say they've not serviced me but you don't even know the name of person that is servicing you that shows that you are not doing your responsibility by even paying or doing the right thing so the question is who's your psp how much do you pay and you're saying you are not being serviced you don't know the person that service you don't know what day they come every psp in every street have a day they come they don't turn up randomly because all the cdas and cdc's knows when to let them in when to come around so those things are something that are very special so it goes down to awareness and education everybody needs to play their part if somebody is not coming have you asked the question and the biggest problem that we have overall is containerization of our waste all of us we eat in plates we don't eat on our palms and we don't eat on leaves well how many of us have a bin in our house if you don't have a bin you cannot hog waste you have to put it somewhere but if you have a bin at least you can put it somewhere for somebody to come every monday or every tuesday to come and take it but if you don't have a bin where do you put it it becomes a problem and that's why we are promoting adopt a bin adopt a bin in your own way either you buy outrightly you pay instrumentally you buy a drum you buy just contain your waste somewhere uh, quite impressive uh, but you said something very uh very important very key that at every point on a single day about a thousand people enter lagos and uh, there is a challenge the challenge is that if you limit desensitization if you limit your activities to lagos alone then definitely uh leaving other places it will still come back to lagos at another time now the challenge as much as you are carrying it in another way others are lowering it there is carbon capture which some other persons have described as a major challenge which is being promoted by the world bank gas flaring is a major major uh, uh, contributor to climate change now the world bank is promoting carbon capture 
there is a white, uh, white campaign against it. What is the position of organizations like Telling One Foundation? That's one. The number two is the fact that people want so much from the media, not knowing that the media itself carries a lot of body. We have talked about the economic crisis, the challenges, the funding. Funding climate campaign, climate change campaign, requires a lot of funding. If you are, don't want me to just come to your event and just sit down with you and I report you and I say, uh, Loma MD said this. No, 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 no. It has gone beyond that. Now, the best way people are doing it is to try as much as possible to institute what is called granting, culture of granting. Could you introduce granting system that you can monitor? Where you come, bring stakeholders together. Let people go out. I have fellows that I actually mentor, that I mentor. When they go out and they do good reporting, that you can say this is good enough. Not he said, he has said, he will say. But in a way to do that, somebody will have to be on the field. To go to the field to do that requires funding. No media house. Just one or two in Nigeria will be able to say, I want to fund a reporter to go to Bayesa, to go to Edo, to go to different places. It will require funding. The only way you can intervene to come in is to institute granting system that you can monitor. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then one more comment. Uh, good morning. Uh, is it afternoon? Yeah, my name is uh, Suleiman Dukwa. I'm the founder of uh, Green Sahara Farms, a member of the Circular Bioeconomy Alliance, and I'm leading the lab, uh, leading Living Lab Nigeria on behalf of His uh, Majesty King Charles III. Uh, it's two things I noticed that I need to talk about education. There's awareness, there's education. And we're having, even here, there's a structural defect in the conversation. Because first, and uh, we have an opportunity, fortunately we're in the British High Commission, uh, we, uh, we have a great opportunity. Uh, uh, the fundamentals are missing. The conversation is about social organization and economic governance of our resource. We're, we're, and, and the media, is not educated enough to understand the issues. And in my interaction, even policy makers in Nigeria, in Africa, do not understand that without that foundation, you are just working on top because the fundamental transition that is required. Because we have to reimagine it completely. And that is why, fortunately, we are here. And there's a thinking and there's an opportunity when the British High Commission, 20 years ago, I started following His Majesty. And uh, there's this thinking. He wrote a book, Harmony. Then he's leading the transition to a circular bioeconomy, which is a complete reversal, and which is a complete thinking, because we are talking about finite resources of how even the economy is run. Go to the website, there's a 10 action plan. So it is time people criticize the commonwealth because it is this and that and that. It is more like a Boy Scout club. So now, I wrote something that I'm not even brave to send out. We hope His Majesty will have the courage to walk his talk because it's basically what he has proposed in that CBA is basically reversing completely what his ancestors have done. And that is where I think we have a weakness in the conversation. We are in a transition which we first have to address, understand that we have a finite resource, which is national capital, that we are running an economy based on transactional capital, which is replaceable. Well, the natural capital is not replaceable. At the point we are now, the resources we are using, it is not a Lagos problem, it is not a London problem, it is, not, it is a world problem. We are at 1.7 where we are right now with what we are using. If we continue using it, we are going to be needing four times the space. This is the economy. So we have to change how we report our accounting on the balance sheet. 
whereby, like now, if you go and do an analysis of what Loma is doing, I don't, I don't see the ecological footprint because I see a lot of things. That's why it is fundamental. I see a lot of things going, carbon entering here, going out here, truck here, this year. So at the end of the day, you, are, you may have a net oh, a positive, negative effect overall in the system in what LOMA is doing. And that is my point is that education is critical. You have to understand what is your ecological. You have to apply certain tools like iPad. You have to do a critical analysis. Our vice president said something and we just ran a program. And I realized that in just one sector, there is an like what the MD said, there's an economic value of $1 trillion. And the good thing about climate adaptation finance, you have had data. Because you are working from what he has said 40, 50 years ago, people thinking they've already done the math. So unlike my presentation of a business to the bank, where I'm assuming a lot of things will happen, in climate adaptation, business modeling, and finance, you already know what is happening, and you now identify the vulnerability and the impact, and you understand the economic opportunity is there. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, such a privilege to be here. I've um, had a lot and learned a lot. It's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Oluwa Sheo. I'm a spoken word poet. And um, today I would be doing a poem I wrote about climate action. Okay, so. I formed a story in my head. A young boy who loved his father dearly but knew nothing about guns, found a loaded one in his father's drawer. While the man was asleep, the young boy pointed the gun at the man's heart and squeezed the trigger. Guess what happened? The man did not die because the boy did not know that guns could kill. Now, that's fantasy, yet you find it very difficult to believe because you know that a thing was done out of ignorance has never reduced its consequences. That a thing was done out of ignorance has never reduced its consequences. Dear citizen of Earth, just how much do you know about the world you live in? Fact, in Oceania, a man can be jailed for forgetting his wife's birthday. God help those who are five. Fact. In Switzerland, you can't flush your own toilet once it's past 10 p.m. Fact. It is illegal to sing off-key in North California. I bet a lot of people would play deaf and dumb during Sunday worship. Fact. In Singapore, it is a crime to chew gum without a, a doctor's prescription. Fact. We know that every time we spare a tree, we spare ourselves the agony of losing our properties to flood. We know that the pollution of water that will harm the fish will come back to harm our belly. Climate change is a basket that we all have weaved. And today, as we become aware, we wear the consciousness of responsibility. We have the ability to do little things and make a huge difference. Together, by all means, I perform a poem, you write a book, you propose a bill, you instruct a child. We would not fold our arms and watch this darkness go wild. Why terrorism is a dog that has been barking at us for ages. Climate change is a lion sneaking up on us without roaring. Why terrorism has been a dog that has been barking at us for ages. Climate change is a lion sneaking up, sneaking, sneaking up on us without roaring. We would not wait till we are devoured. We will act on these warnings. We act as a city that is circumspect, as a nation taking steps in retrospect, as a world that is aware that we are in a warfare. When we become intentional about having a world that is sustainable, a lot then becomes achievable. Remember that awareness is a weapon we all must harness. Remember that a thing was done out of ignorance has never reduced its consequences. So today, we take a stand and promise ourselves 
and take a vow to begin to take all of the right actions. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks a lot for that. Okay, so in concluding, we'll, we'll be done in five minutes. I would like to call on um, one of the partners to Sterling One Foundation, uh, Mujib Bakari of Sterling Bank, to come up. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the best thing that can happen to you is being called after the action because uh, a lot has happened here today. Uh, on behalf of Abubakar Suleiman, the managing director of Sterling Bank, you heard him when he said um, it's more about climate opportunities, not only about climate action. Um, there are a lot of opportunities that we can take out even from our environment in taking climate action responsibilities. And it's really very important. As an organization, we have strategically partnered with uh, the One Foundation because we know that there's a lot that needs to be done within our environment. And for us at Sterling Bank, it's more about what kind of impact do we create for our environment. And that leads us to the story of our impactful banking. So we have what we call the heart of Sterling, where we have strategically decided that we are going to you know, really impact on health, education, agriculture, renewable energy, and transportation. Pedro had spoken about our renewable energy. Um, it's a beauty to behold on Marina. We are wrapped in solar energy. Uh, transition into clean energy. And I believe that what is missing in the conversation is the partnership that we need to continuously have. The media, we've spoken much about you here today. It's not only about the money. It's not about the money. It's about you deciding that you want to make a change. And we can make a change. As you live here today, just decide on your own that that plastic bottle, instead of throwing it out of your window, you will keep it and make sure you start recycling at home. And we must pass this knowledge onto our children as well. Uh, we have a lot of impact in our environment. Conversation for sustainable change starts with everybody coming together. And we've come together today. Let today mean something. Let today mean something. And it can only mean something when you do take action. And um, I'm sure, uh, British Deputy High Commissioner, sir, you have said and you have assured that you continue to be in this move to drive with us. Uh, Commissioner for Lagos State, I know you have started something very great. And other partners in this room, I don't want to mention, uh, uh, there's no time enough to mention everybody. I would have loved to mention everybody. But I tell you that the critical thing that we need to do to move forward is to take ownership. How do you take ownership? We know that this country is ours. This is a sustainable environment. It's us to own, it's us to sustain, it's us to continue to make sure that we succeed. Let's do it together and uh, happy International Climate Action Day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Moji. Thank you a lot for that um, short speech. So um, I will just call um, Ben up just for a brief remark. And then once Ben is done with the um, group remark, we have a group picture for everyone right outside here. Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I think what we've heard today is not just a statement about commitment to action, but also a restatement of the urgency of action. And I think if, uh, if the experience of 2021 to 2022 has shown us anything, it's that uh, we can talk. We can all talk. What we do is really what matters now. And I think as we go into COP27, I think the media has a vital role in keeping us to our word and making our words count. So I'm so, so grateful for people joining us today. If I can leave you with that one thought, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you once again for everyone for coming. And um, we're going to have a networking session outside where you can have some food and drinks and picture session as well too. So we'll start with dignitaries who will start by the media wall for some pictures and then everyone else can join. Thanks again. <laughs>